they're telling me they clean it up. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Marin Energy Authority Board meeting for Thursday, September 6th. Good to see everyone again. Uh, why don't we get right into it with item one, board announcements. Um, I'm going to defer to Barbara and George about this um, bill, but there's a bill on Governor Brown's desk, AD 976, which is really going to squelch uh, community choice aggregation by prohibiting anyone who provides any type of consulting service on the feasibility for creating a new CCA from ever getting a contract if the CCA is actually formed. So it's, it's, it's a poison pill in the name of good government, and I don't know if um, we can make an emergency, uh, add it as an emergency item to the agenda to write a letter from our agency opposing this bill. Um, but I think we ought to do it. He's got a lot of bad bills sitting on his desk. Uh, Director Bragman, we have done that, and also the county has done that. Okay, so I'm so absolutely. Okay, this right. one's been on our radar okay. screen for right. a while, but thank you for okay. reiterating right. that. Thank you. I also visited the governor's office last week and met with his staff regarding our veto request. Do you want to report? That was Friday, right, Don? Do you want to report on that later during yes. your report? Yes, sure. During my report, I will be Great. Well, have we had any positive feedback from our interaction? Why don't we wait until we get okay. to that? Any other board announcements? Seeing none, we'll move to item two, public open time. Any matters that are not on the agenda? Good evening, Barbara. Good evening. Um, if you haven't met them yet, we have three people here from San Luis Obispo, which is just fantastic. We've been involved in the San San Luis Obispo Resco project and other CCA organizing efforts, and Eric, Jim, and Scott. Thank um, you for having us. Well, okay. So it's really Thank cool you, to have them here. And they, we had a workshop today and talked about many things. And um, it kind of reminded me because they're in, you know, looking at that steep climb to get a CCA, and it reminded me of what we've been through and what it means that we made it through the process that, that we did. And, and it's just, um, you know, I've been, you know, like trying to express to them what it, you know, what did we get for all this work and, you know, craziness. And I said, well, one of the things you'll see tonight is, you know, the happiest board of any agency that I ever saw. And, you know, and just an a incredible sense of pride in what we've accomplished and, and what we've done and how much that means to the climate and the, you know, and frankly to our democracy. Um, I, you know, I see so much anti-democratic, you know, efforts going on in, in the community, in, in the energy world. And right now, in, in the energy efficiency world, it's, you know, we're going to talk about that a little later. And I just, I'm just going to say there was one um, regional energy network that um, pro pro made a proposal. Um, there, were, there were three proposals, and one um, has already um, bowed out because they had a little talk with PG&E and and they, the utilities convinced them that it really wouldn't be a good idea to go forward with their proposal, even though they are the only um, really strong residential financing program in the state. They have a track record working with um, stimulus funds, and they provide air conditioning um, uh, efficiencies, which hardly anybody else in the state is doing. So I, I think it's just incredible that, you know, the utilities have basically stamped out more of their competition and therefore, um, you know, the, we will have to use more dirty energy because these people will no longer be able to do what they were doing really well and could have done a lot more. Uh, so, so it's really meaningful to me that there are other CCAs forming around the state and I'm, you know, I'm 
I'm thrilled to be in touch with them, and I'm so happy that these guys showed up here. Well, thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Plus, a really wonderful woman from Oakland who was <laughs> like, looking at this possibility. So. Great. Well, thank you again for joining us. Uh, please let us know if we can give you any more information. Um, I'll know real quickly. I'm actually traveling out to Humboldt County uh, in the next couple weeks to Harvest. spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> I'm not going to ask for what. But <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Eric Beam, uh, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Slow County Clean Energy Coalition. And we're committed to uh, local clean energy and the possibility that community choice is for our communities in San Luis Obispo County. And I just wanted to uh, share with you, as a board of cities and county, uh, how important your leadership has been and how supportive your staff has been um, in our visit here and in inspiring us to go and carry on good work for climate and uh, local control and all the benefits that you've seen in the possibility that you've followed to uh, where you are now. So I appreciate all your leadership and uh, you're, you've left, you laid a groundwork for uh, the future energy in California. So thank you. Any other members of the public? Okay, seeing none. Move to item three, report from executive office. Great, so I have four items tonight. The first thing I wanted to report on is um, just the exciting news that the CPC has approved our 2012 energy efficiency plan. Uh, just two weeks ago, on August 23rd, it was approved. And so we've been very busy in the last nine days um, getting a lot of pieces of the program up and running. We've um, been recruiting for uh, someone to fill our EE coordinator position, and we have our final two interviews tomorrow and expect to be um, filling that position next week. Um, we've also been working on developing contracts with many of the vendor agencies that will be providing services to us. Um, the program, just as a reminder, is going to be a multifamily program, really focused on multifamily buildings throughout Marin and Richmond. And we've identified uh, a number of key vendors that will be able to help us both on the outreach front um, and engaging uh, interested uh, property owners and, as well as tenants. Um, and we've also been uh, working with folks who will be able to help us on the technical front, um, uh, helping to conduct the audits, the retrofits themselves, bringing the um, contractors in to, to do the retrofits, and then doing the, um, the uh, measurement and verification at the end to um, ensure that we're achieving the, the savings targets that we've set out. So we're really excited about getting this program up and going. We're going to spend a little bit of time at the retreat on Monday, um, hearing from some of the vendors and hearing about some of the detail of the components of the program. Um, we've also been talking to a few of our board members um, regarding personal connections that they have with property owners and managers um, throughout our region. And um, if, if you all have any recommendations of folks you think would be interested in some um, energy efficiency upgrades with some incentives that go with that, um, we'd love to um, hear more about them. So um, more to come on that front. John, a question. You're, you're, you're focusing on multi-unit dwellings now. Is the plan eventually to expand to single-family residences? Yes. The plan for 2013-14 is a much more robust, comprehensive program that will include a continuation of multi-family, but will also add a single-family uh, behavior-focused um, energy efficiency piece, which will involve uh, software outreach, um, and grassroots organizing, and friendly competitions with uh, schools and community groups. Um, and that's a very exciting um, part of the program that we're looking forward to launching. Then we're also going to have a small commercial, small business um, component of the program that offers direct services to small grocers, um, such as mini marts and uh, gas station um, markets, that sort of thing, uh, restaurants and professional buildings. So we'll be targeting those um, customer groups for our uh, small commercial program. We will also be offering an on-bill repayment program, uh, which I, the next thing I want to talk about when we get into the, I wanted to say a little bit about our PACE exploration uh, over recent months. Uh, but along those lines, we're looking at some ways that customers will be able to finance large full house or full building retrofits to get at some of the deeper retrofits that cost a little more up front, but can really um, save a lot of money and energy over time. 
So um, it will include those components. And then the, the last component that will be included in our 1314 plan is a standard offer for energy efficiency procurement, which is um, a program that's common in te Texas and the New England market that we're interested in piloting here in our jurisdiction, which allows vendors to bid into us uh, kilowatts of savings that they um, believe they can achieve. And then we pay them based on the amount that they deliver to us. So it puts a lot of the risk and programmatic design on the vendor um, and allows us to um, pay based on the amount of savings that's delivered, kind of like a feed-in tariff program. So it will be a much more comprehensive program once we get to 2013, 2014. Although it's worth noting that that program, uh, we have applied to the CPUC for the 2013, 2014 program, but we have not yet, uh, that plan has not yet been approved by the CPUC. They are projecting that um, the decisions on those programs will be released the first week of November. Um, so we'll be on the lookout for next steps on that. <coughs> Any other questions on the EE program? Okay. Um, the next thing I wanted to update folks on is that um, we have a couple of, in addition to our energy efficiency <coughs> coordinator hire, um, there have been, uh, there are two other um, staffing changes that, that I wanted to just update the board on. Um, Sarah Gardner, our former clerk, has moved into um, the uh, into the position um, that uh, was uh, open, and it's the administrative associate position um, as of September first. So welcome, welcome to your new position, and unfortunately, Sarah is still doing her old position. <laughs> Happy that I'm leaving clerk. It makes me happy that I'm not having to do both jobs at once. That makes forever. <laughs> yeah, so we um, we conducted a recruitment to fill the clerk position. Uh, we've just concluded all of the interviews today and offered the position um, to someone who accepted. So um, I'm happy to announce that our new clerk uh, is going to be Jar Darlene Jackson, and she will be joining us on Monday at the retreat. Um, then the next thing I wanted to update folks on is um, the Assembly Bill 976, which was um, uh, which Director Bragman brought up. Um, we have been very concerned about this bill. We've been watching it um, for a couple of years. It was actually going through the legisl legislative cycle last year and died, uh, but it came back to life um, this year, unfortunately, and ended up passing kind of both both sides and uh, is now on the governor's desk awaiting approval. Um, we didn't expect it to get that far and, and I'm kind of disappointed to see that it has. It, it doesn't have um, any backing beyond um, the uh, electrical union that uh, typically does bidding for the IOUs. And um, it kind of singles out CCA providers as a subsection of local government entities that would have these additional restrictions placed um, on us for how we do our hiring. And it, it would restrict our ability to um, hire a consultant uh, both before and after providing service to customers. Um, it may not affect MEA, it's likely that it wouldn't affect MEA going forward, but it would certainly have um, a detrimental impact on any other CCA effort. Um, as, as you all probably remember from our time of launch, um, the, the point of launching a CCA program is extremely critical and you need to have continuity, you need to have power supply lined up in advance, so you need to be working with um, folks in the, in the consulting industry that can help you both before and after, um, or you're really at a, a significant disadvantage. Um, the language is also broad enough that it could be interpreted to apply to power suppliers. So that would mean that you wouldn't be able to negotiate a power supply agreement before serving customers and then use it to serve your customers. You'd have to start from scratch on the day you begin serving customers, which actually is just isn't possible. So um, it's a very um, poorly crafted bill that doesn't seem to have any uh, beneficial goal except to um, prevent CCAs from forming in the future. And we've articulated that in a veto request um, letter to the governor's office, and we met with the governor's office last Friday with um, two of his staff, Martha Guzman and Ken Alex, and they understood very well what the problems were with this bill um, and seemed to be in strong agreement with us. They made some recommendations about um, 
uh, calls that can be made from key folks in, um, in Marin County that, that have ties to Governor Brown, and so we followed up on that. And um, we have seen a lot of veto request letters coming across from a variety of different organizations. Um, kudos to Lean for getting the word out because there, there have been um, a lot of letters coming in from the Sierra Club and a lot of cities and towns um, throughout um, California requesting a veto on this bill. I, I believe the governor has until September 30th to make a final decision. Um, if anyone else um, has uh, thoughts or suggestions on calls that could be made or, or um, letters that could come from uh, your city or town or any other entity, um, I think that certainly would be helpful. Um, it's also worth mentioning there's a place on the website, uh, the governor's website, if you go to this particular bill, you can log, you can register your position for a con um, on the website. And um, a, lot of, a lot of folks that have sent in letters have also done that, and um, I, I certainly would recommend doing that. It's pretty quick and easy to go through that. Yes? Well, on, on that, uh, regarding uh, letters from the cities, <coughs> Can perhaps staff put together a, a draft letter, forward it over, and then we all are pretty much back in session now. Uh, from the summer, everyone's going to have two meetings this month, at least most likely. And so, if you get it to us, we can get it on the agenda, use it, uh, and see if we can get our council members to agree that the respective mayors can sign such a letter and, and send one off. So, if you want to get on that, we can hopefully get all 11 cities to do that. I think that'd yeah, be. Yeah, we have a template re available already, so um, we'll send that out to everyone tomorrow. So <coughs> Great. So you can get it out tomorrow? Yeah. It's our council meeting is Monday. thing I wanted to provide an update on is our continued exploration of a PACE program, um, which would allow customers to do an energy upgrade or uh, solar installation and pay for the cost up front, uh, the upfront cost on their property tax bill. Um, we've been looking into ways that we could launch a commercial and residential program, and actually over the last month there's been a bit of activity. We met multiple times with Y Green, I think we have a representative here um, who has been affiliated with Y Green, um, and um, we determined, unfortunately, that they would not be able to offer the financing or the startup funds that, that are needed to launch a PACE program uh, locally here in Marin. Um, we also, as part of that effort, had a meeting with the Marin Community Foundation, and um, we're told uh, there that also NCF would not be um, able to play the role of providing financing for uh, the PACE program. So that's unfortunate. Um, we certainly would need to have a, um, a financing partner, whether it be a bank or a nonprofit um, or a for-profit um, agency, that would be able to play that role of, of financier. So. Um, at this point, that has not yet been determined. We have not been able to find a partner. Um, but on a parallel track, we've spent some time working with a Bay Area-wide effort called Bay Then to uh, launch a Bay Area-wide PACE program in the 2013-2014 energy efficiency cycle. Um, they applied at the same time that we applied to the CPUC for an energy efficiency program, and their um, the, their PACE uh, component of the plan is something that we supported in our proposal, and um, we would be very pleased to see that move forward. That would be a way for us to um, have a PACE program offered here locally, um, but it would be operated through this Bay Area-wide um, program, um, which would um, make it um, seamless for folks that were um, living in multiple, living in different places. Yeah, Director Evans. Um, Go ahead, first. Okay. Ladies first. Um, I just talked with the uh, CEO of Umqua Bank that just uh, purchased Circle Bank um, and all the facilities around here, you know, all the banks. Um, and he, one of the things that he suggested to me was that they're the largest community bank and they're growing and how m much they want to really come here and make a statement. And that if we know of anything that maybe they should be looking at helping or being involved with because their resources are so huge. Uh, it may be an appropriate time to hit them up or have a discussion with them prior to anybody else getting to them. Mm -hmm. And I'd be happy to pass along the contact information for you. Because he's the head. He, I mean, he's the head head. So, um, and he's coming down here in a few weeks or so. So maybe there could be something set up. Okay, good. I'll send you that. So. Thank you. My, my question, Don, was... Um, is there some sort of minimum seed level 
of money that would be necessary to get this off the ground for Marin County if the Bay Area wide program uh, didn't come to fruition? Yeah. What, what, what would that amount be? 20 million is the amount that's needed um, as the, the financing pool. There's also a need for startup funding, meaning that startup uh, funds um, sort of range between uh, 200,000 and 250,000. And after that time, the program would be self-sustaining. <coughs> Um, I think it's also worth mentioning along these lines that the continuing um, FHFA issues do raise a good deal of legal risk um, and, and issues on particularly around residential PACE programs. So utilizing the Bay Area wide program might be a way to um, uh, prevent MEA from being exposed to those ri risks directly. But we'll continue to monitor um, that whole process and look for opportunities that would be a good fit with minimal legal risk and access to financing. Don, who, who's financing the Bay Area Y program? Um, they are working with banks, but have not yet um, firmed up their partner. Um, but they're confident they will be with um, I, I don't know enough about the effort to say uh, what their likelihood of success is. They do have some, um, some experienced uh, stakeholders and partner agencies that ABAG um, helped <coughs> develop their proposal and many of the cities and counties participated heavily in that. I don't think that they necessarily have the finance experience needed to develop a program, um, but they do have a lot of other experience and resources that could be brought to the table and if they find the right finance partner, I think it could be a, a strong program. Um, and yeah, I think ABAG is through us who is leading that. We are also working on an on their financing program, as I mentioned, um, and the, the bank that is very interested in um, working with us on that pilot is Union Bank. So we've had some um, early discussions with them, and um, hopefully that will that will move forward, and we'll be offering. On the financing to 250 customers in Marin and 250 customers in Richmond starting next year. And, and what about uh, partnering with Sonoma? Yeah, um, we've spent a lot of time uh, working with Sonoma and, and looking at ways that we could adapt that program to Marin. And those are the discussions that um, we've had. Uh, we've had discussions with the County of Marin and the Marin Community Foundation. Um, and actually submitted multiple proposals um, to try and build a program that's exactly like Sonoma County, in fact, consulting with them to help get the program off the ground. Um, I think if we were to develop a program in, in Marin County, it would need to be very similar or um, exactly, you know, designed exactly like the Sonoma County program because we have a lot of contractors that do work in both places and it would help with customer confusion and plus it's a great program. Um, the problem though is that we do not have a source of financing and the source of financing in Sonoma County um, has been a, you know, a, a retirement pool, um, water agency funds and um, a pool of funds that the government officials in Sonoma were comfortable using the government officials in Marin County are not comfortable using that same approach here. They see it as too risky. Would Sonoma be willing to expand the territory that its fund covers? That's a possibility. They've been uh, undergoing some other challenges um, in the last year, so, so they'd be looking for um, some investment um, in from other places, namely you know, Marin or banks that we could bring to the table to, to be able to move that forward. Um, so at this time, we haven't seen a, a solution for that, but that could be an option in the future. Yes. Thank you, Don. Any uh, further questions for Don from the board? Any members of the public, any public comment on this item? I just want to raise an issue that I don't know enough about yet, but I just want to flag something. Um, the PACE programs, as you know, you know, were shut down by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, quite a while ago, a couple of years ago. And it's, um, 
possible that something will change there, but it's also possible that it'll stay stagnant and won't go forward. I think it would be a really good idea to explore other avenues, even though there's a lot of people that bought into PACE. Um, it, you know, so far it's kind of a dead end. And as far as I, I've, I've heard some things recently that really make me wonder about it, and I need to get a lot more information before I can, you know, give you anything really useful there. But um, I, I think it's important just to, to note that some of the commercial, they say commercial pays has been a success, but my understanding is that that is basically property owners who have paid off their properties and don't have a mortgage. So um, basically the problem that, have, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac brought up is, you know, is a pretty big problem. And, uh, and I think there, there were two days of workshops at the CPUC this January that explored all kinds of financing options. And I think it's unfortunate that the, you know, so many people in the state have been trying so hard to get pace off the ground, even though it's not working. And I think it would be a really good idea to explore some of these other methods um, with as much, you know, energy as, as we've put into pace so far. And I hope to have a lot more information very soon. Thank you. Any further public comment? Okay, uh, let's move to item four on the consent calendar. <coughs> Hopefully everyone's had a chance to review it. Any questions or comments? <coughs> Can I have a motion? I'll move it to you. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That matter carries. Item five, communications update. I will end a PowerPoint today, and the printout is, should be um, in front of each of you all. And what I want to update everyone about today is the uh, qualitative consumer research that has been underway this month uh, by APCO Worldwide. Uh, the addendum to the contract with APCO was approved by our board um, in early August, and um, last week, APCO conducted two focus groups um, on the 29th here in Marin. Um, the focus groups had 10 participants in each group. The first group was of customers who chose to become Marin Clean Energy customers, and the second group was with electric customers who chose to opt out. Um, there was a, a good uh, diverse group of people in each group based off of their zip code, so what city they lived in, whether they were male or female, their political affiliation, um, a nice uh, range in age uh, from about 25 to 55, and also for income. So the, the groups lasted about an hour and a half, and uh, they were facilitated by a representative from APCO. And um, APCO has also conducted uh, three of six in-depth telephone interviews with um, Marin business customers. Um, we promised Anna Min, uh, Anna Min anonymity to those customers, so we won't be disclosing who the business customers were, but half of those are completed. Um, they're one-on-one -on -one and last about 45 minutes, and we have four additional uh, telephone interviews scheduled with uh, representatives from the city of Richmond, and those are scheduled to be completed um, the second week of September by the 11th. And so what I wanted to provide you all with today was just sort of a high-level overview of the outcome from the focus groups and the interviews that APCO has conducted so far. Um, is there actually one more slide? Oops, sorry. That's okay. Thanks. Um, so basically what the, um, what the focus groups and the in-depth interviews have told us so far is that customers who have decided to stay with Marine Clean Energy are generally much more well informed about our program and all the details of it than those who have chosen to opt out. Um, that being said, uh, it looks like both groups of customers still needed more information about marine clean energy. There were fundamental things that uh, people in both groups and in the interviews didn't know about, such as the fact that marine clean energy is a not-for-profit, questions about the actual percentage of renewable energy that we're delivering, where it comes from, um, and what types of renewable we're using. Um, so it's obvious that more information still needs to be delivered to the public in Marin about Marin Clean Energy so that customers can make their choice. 
Um, we learned that customers who decided to stay with Marin Clean Energy really have um, chosen to be with us because they value the fact that we give them a choice, that they feel empowered uh, with the choice even if it does cost a little bit more, and um, that they want to do something to help the environment. So um, they're willing to stay with us. Next slide. For the customers who opted out, um, a lot of them voiced um, surprise when they became uh, customers of Marine Clean Energy, either through their bill or through their opt-out notice. Um, they disliked the automatic enrollment, which we've heard before, um, and the fact that we're a government agency imposing the enrollment. And then uh, the main reasons that people disclosed for opting out was discomfort with change in general, um, feeling like switching to marine clean energy wasn't worth the change because everything is still going through PG&E as far as the billing, um, their infrastructure. Uh, customers said that they were comfortable with PG&E despite the fact that they felt like there were um, shortcomings with the service they got from PG&E, but <coughs> that they were just comfortable with it the way it was. Again, we heard that people didn't have enough information about the program to make a well-informed choice. Um, people were concerned about rates. And then um, some people just didn't feel that the value of having clean energy was worth the switch to them. Um, another concern that we heard about in both groups was um, <coughs> the fact that Marine Clean Energy doesn't own our own power supply right now. Um, and they felt like that was um, a lack of value to the customer. And then if you go to the next slide. Um, so what we're, we're planning on doing now is finishing up the in-depth interviews. I mentioned earlier that those are scheduled to be finished uh, by the 11th of September. That'll include all of the interviews in Richmond. Uh, we worked with uh, City of Richmond staff and elected officials to determine who in Richmond would um, be good to interview for these, um, for these meetings. And uh, based on the interviews and the focus groups, we'll be developing a survey questionnaire. Um, we'll have a draft provided to staff by the 14th, and I'll plan on bringing that to the executive committee meeting in September for review. Um, once that's finalized, we can begin the launch of the telephone surveys, and that's scheduled to start on September 24th and be completed in mid-October. So that was a brief communications update, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have. Yes. Director Sears. Jamie, I've got a question for I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. Did you say that the age range of the members of the focus groups was age 25 to 55? Yes. I guess I'm a little surprised by that because it's my understanding that nearly a quarter of the population of Marin County is age 60 years and older. So it seems like we're missing a demographic that might have some meaning. Yeah. We did um, have a screening for uh, the participants in the focus group, and the majority of the customers in the focus groups were in the 45 to 55 range. Um, I'm not sure why we weren't able to get anyone above that, but it's something that I can bring up with APCO to discuss, and I think um, along with that, what we need to consider, which I don't have here, was uh, the people that we interviewed for the in-depth interviews, the commercial customers, um, and the age range there, and also the age range in Richmond, although. Okay. That'd be great if you could follow up on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that some of the screening criteria included, I think that APCO was looking to determine folks that were um, up to date on current issues. They asked, you know, from how frequently do you read a local newspaper publication? When was the last, you know, have you ever um, commented on uh, in the local media? Um, are you, you know, are you subscribing to magazines? So some of some of it was tried to gauge um, how uh, engaged the the um, individual might be in current issues, and, and therefore would be able to um, uh, kind of speak for. Um, more than just their own personal experience. I think that was part of what they were getting at, but it, it will be used to deliver that again to see what their rationale is. They were looking for, for the in-depth interviews and for the focus groups, really people who could be identified as thought leaders. So not only people who were you know, up to, to speed on what's going on in Marin County, but also up to speed in, in general about energy issues um, to sort of set the, you know, the level of knowledge that might have also had something to do with it. And I think it's worth keeping in mind that the purpose of the focus groups was to help kind of 
drill down on which questions will be important to ask the broader group of, um, of folks in Marin, both, both customers and non-customers. There will be uh, a lot of uh, surveys will be done on a much broader scale. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I would appreciate your following up with the more because I don't think you should assume that people who are older, over 55, who may not be that up to speed on energy issues, they're still making a decision based on whether they want to use marine clean energy or not. And so I would think that we'd want information about what they do know and what questions are relevant to that segment of the population as well. So if you could just revisit that uh, reasoning with that, that would be great. Absolutely. Yeah, I think as we've noted in the past, we do hear a lot from seniors in Marin mm -hmm. County about the program. Mm -hmm. Uh, raising many of the same issues you have this evening, but nevertheless, I agree with that. Yeah. So, yeah. If, I, if I could just chime in quickly and say that since I'm out of that age range, mm -hmm. and one of those older set that um, we I totally, we don't believe it. I totally <laughs> agree with you, and I would say for the majority of residents that came uh, to speak at our town uh, in reference to this process when we were um, joining you all, we're over 60 and I would say that group in our community is oftentimes the most active because they're not as busy with uh, their young families so I think that's a real segment that that you're missing right I and they the are they are thought 60. leaders in terms of people in the community <laughs> following them. so yes. <laughs> this is really a conversation worth having and I really thought you were 45 so oh, I'm you're sure. so yeah, sweet. I <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Question, Jamie. What exactly is APCO's charge? Are they supposed to design and conduct a survey for us? We obviously we know most of this already from all the criticisms we encountered two years ago. Uh, or are they supposed to go beyond that and, and help us sort of resolve some of these and, and change some minds? Right. So it starts out with the in-depth interviews and the focus groups and the information that they gather from, from those uh, meetings will be used to create the, the surveys and the questions and a reputation model. Um, following the, the surveys and then the creation of this reputation model, the next step for APCO would be to help us to determine what things we need to communicate to customers and how we communicate it to them um, in Marin and in Richmond. So they'll so go really ahead three that part, step. which is really the most important. Right, so it's really a three-step process. Okay. So and this is the first step. Director Cromwell actually asked me questions. <laughs> Great minds think alike. Yeah, that's what that's what Any that's further that's questions that's from the board? Um, okay, members of the public, Bob, welcome. Uh, as, as some of you know, this is right in my wheelhouse and the kind of stuff I used to do for a living. Um, one thing I saw in there is a little related to the age thing, but it's, it's slightly different. Is one result that was posted there really set off an alarm bell. Which, uh, and I can hypothesize three or four reasons in the dynamics of how focus groups work, why it happened, especially when I hear that people were recruited as thought leaders. But that conclusion, that set of conclusions about uh, our current customers and all the wonderful positive feelings they have, I think that's great. But I got a loud alarm bell that says, I doubt that's representative of the majority of our customers. Uh, and the, the trap would be to formulate all our questions going forward for our customers, sort of assuming that we're operating in that space as opposed to the utterly blank space that says, MEA, who the hell are they? Because I think that's probably representative of about 60 or 70 percent of our customers, even in educated, articulate Marin. And this process doesn't flush that out. So I would just caution, be very careful not to overuse, especially two focus groups, you know, where I come from is a tiny number of focus groups. And there's a cost reason for that, but it's a tiny number of focus groups. Um, be very careful not to over, over focus on those results moving into the questionnaire. And especially that thing about the current users. I just, my, my gut tells me that's a very deceptive conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? Okay, thanks, Jamie. Okay, item six, regulatory update. Uh, relatively early. Early, I was about to say it's not, you know, you know, it's, it's not 9 p.m., which I'm, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm 
happy to have people's attention earlier on. Um, I'll just buzz through. We haven't, we didn't have a regulatory update last month since last month's board meeting was a lighter one, um, and so I hope everybody read the 250-page regulatory packet this month. Uh, we've been busy, and we've been very busy in the past two months. Um, so if you go to the first slide. Um, first, I just want to congratulate the energy efficiency team. Don spoke on this item before, but our resolution was approved um, by the commission. Um, and just since Don has already touched on this, I'll only spend a moment on it. But you know, it's worth noting that there's a couple of ways by which CCAs can access energy efficiency funds. Um, one is simply to just submit a request to the Public Utilities Commission, and those funds relate only to existing CCA customers and the revenues that come from the public goods charge uh, on those customers' bills. And then the second way is actually you can you can ask for a broader range of funds under under a different um, provision under the Public Utilities Code, which allows you to you know undertake a larger program so that has to go through an approval process. So that's the 2013-2014 um, is this broader process. Um, the narrow process is 2012, but in any event, this is you know a, a new new statutory provision that's being used, and it's um, a very exciting step forward. It's 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 a very um, at the commission. You know, energy efficiency is first in the loading order, and these are very. These are very important issues, and so this is a huge kudos, and I think it's wonderful that um, these programs are going to be launched for underserved uh, underserved areas in the realm of energy efficiency, and it'll be wonderful to be able to serve customers in a new way. So that's that's a little bit of the warm, fuzzy tangent of the regulatory update, but I'll, so I'll move on. I'll move on to, move to uh, what I'm used to here. Um, and the next item is uh, an update on Senate Bill 79, 790, that is um, the new CCA legislation from last year. There's a rulemaking that's been um, ongoing since February. That's when the rulemaking was issued. Um, in March, uh, we drew together a very large alliance um, along with LEAN, along with um, a wide range of CCA interests into what we're calling the CCA Alliance. We compiled extensive comments on uh, the rulemaking and the issues set forth therein, um, and for months it has been kind of radio silence on uh, this <laughs> proceeding. So uh, it's finally back up and running again. There needs to be a decision by um, the, the Code of Conduct for the uh, investor of utilities needs to be in place by January 1st of next year. So. The Code of Conduct is one provision of SB 790. Uh, various other provisions include um, different cost allocation issues and other items. Um, when the scoping memo was released for this proceeding, um, the proposed rules that were in the rulemaking and the proposed rules in the, um, in the scoping memo were um, very nearly the same. There were some revisions to it, but our very extensive comments appear to maybe not have been heard or maybe had not resonated um, with the commission. The scoping memo also excluded a major component of SB 790, the cost allocation provisions. Um, they determined that that was out of the scope of this proceeding. And so we are taking a, a more uh, scalpel-like approach in this current round of, uh, of comments we're really limiting our comments to how do we improve the proposed rule that the commission has rather than bringing in examples from um, from other states or from other codes of conduct that have, that have been reviewed and approved. Um, so we are interested to see how this develops and also we'll be speaking with the commission about where do they actually see the cost allocation issues being addressed. Um, I would say that the two key issues under the cost allocation provisions are one, uh, you know, it's really structural reforms in the regulatory process. One is to provide additional information to ensure that the commission and stakeholders have sufficient information to determine where cost should be recovered by, where cost should be recovered from where cost should be recovered. Sorry, <laughs> it's not late enough for me to, to be on my aim. And then the second component is how do you ensure um, 
that there's a process in place for um, consistent determinations of cost allocation each time from a procedural manner. And then, you know, we just fight the fights each time it comes around. Um, but how do we make those, those improvements? Um, but getting back to the current proceeding, you know, we'll be, we'll be looking forward to um, seeing revisions to uh, further revisions to the rules. There will be a proposed decision that will be out uh, in November, if not sooner. And we'll certainly keep you posted on that. The next item I wanted to touch on uh, relates to uh, privacy. This really relates to uh, privacy regarding smart meter data of customers and what protections uh, CCAs should have in place. And this is the second phase of this proceeding. The first phase related to electrical corporations, um, so the investor-owned utilities and what privacy rules should apply to them. The second phase of the proceeding um, asked the question whether these privacy protections should be uh, extended to gas corporations, to electric service providers, and to CCAs. Um, we argued that it was outside of the jurisdiction of the commission to do so, um, to, to apply these rules to us. Um, there were revisions made to the decision, um, now we have a final decision, um, that really narrowed the scope of the um, jurisdictional, jurisdictional arguments of the commission, so it seems that um, the end result, you know, we, we don't plan to appeal the result. Um, the, the code of conduct, the language, uh, the revisions that were made to the language of the code of conduct is also um, reasonable. So there's, there's several next steps that will be taking place. One relates to revisions to our adopted privacy policy, that's policy 001. Also revisions to the implementation plan in conformance with the decision. And there are, very, there are various other provisions, but also sort of consistent auditing um, on an annual basis of you know, the, the fact that we're keeping up with our privacy policy. So um, since we, you know, our objective is obviously to have best practices with the, as it relates to the protection of our customers' data, um, you know, many of the components in there really do relate to best practices, so any modifications that we need to our own, um, to our own policies, you know, privacy notices, being provided to customers on an annual basis, or uh, we already have a conspicuous link on our website regarding our privacy policy. We'll take a look at um, whether components are going to need to be changed. So we'll be taking those next steps um, to implement um, provisions of that decision. Um, one victory that we did have in that decision related to um, related to data access. One of the provisions in the in the first phase of the proceeding required uh, the investor and utilities to provide real-time or immediately available information on, um, on usage via their website. And we argued that you know, we're not in control of the meters, and so this isn't appropriate for us to be playing that role. And, and the commission did agree with us that you know, we are not required to provide real-time data because, in essence, we would be asking it, asking to get the data from BGE uh, and then putting it through our system. But we wouldn't, you know, we can't necessarily verify, you know, the quality of their information or their controls on, on their process to us. The next item that I'd like to talk to you sure. about. Did I just ask you a couple of questions sure. before you're going? Um, do you know, is PG&E actually collecting data from the smart meters they've installed in uh, Marin? Yes. <clears throat> and um, are they sharing that information with you in your, in, you know, your territory, our territory here? Um, today we haven't been receiving that data. We will receive that data in the future. And, and um, what that is, First of all, there's there's very significant privacy protections in place uh, for the utilities and how they can utilize um, and you know under certain certain authorized circumstances release that data. So we will be under the equivalent scenario. Um, you know internally, what we've found, for example, there's um, there are several smart grid pilots that are being proposed. Um, so it's how do you use that data to, for example, in forecasting or in 
use that granularity to improve operations and improve the grid? We, we have actually asked pg e to provide that data to us, and um, they have verified that it is being collected and they have it, but um, there is an expense involved for them in validating that data and transmitting it to a third party. And they are, um, they have a request in at the commission for cost recovery for that activity. And they are, um, they are asking all third parties to let them know what type of data they want and in what format so that they aren't doing custom approaches for everyone, but they're asking um, all at one time for cost recovery for a uniform approach that will serve any third party vendor or service in the end. Um, We've, we have informed them about what granularity of data we need, um, which is really just hourly data for our full jurisdiction. We don't need customer-specific um, smart meter data, but, but we would benefit heavily from having the um, hourly actual data so that we can have more accurate forecasting and we'd be able to um, adjust our procurement according to actuals rather than basing our procurement on historic usage patterns. And um, would it be possible for you to send me a link to the decision? The Just to email it to me, the yes. final decision? I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Beth, this is a little off point, but you know, one of the major reasons that PG&E proposed to put in smart meters was so that they would provide data to the customer. So that they could sort out how they're efficient by having data every hour or every day. Uh, and try to sort out a bill that was already <coughs> virtually indecipherable. Is, is there any evidence at all that putting these things in and providing data every hour on the hour and minute on the minute is really helping customers at all? Well, I think that there's there are a lot of um, there are various steps that are going to sort of happen. One relates to sort of this this customer access portion of it. Partially, this relates to third-party development of tools for folks to manage their energy usage at various points in the day. In the future, there's going to be, um, you know, they're looking at various real-time pricing approaches. Um, so how do you, all of this fits in with more granular um, data and knowing your usage on, on a real-time basis. Well, I understand that was their purpose, but I really wonder if that's really going to result. Or are they simply going to bombard customers with data that, that they really cannot interpret? No, I, I, I think that a lot of folks are putting their, their minds on this. Um, and, you know, we'll see what develops in the market for these um, interfaces and tools. Um, but I would assume that there will be some pretty nifty uh, interfaces to help people control and manage their energy usage going forward. Um, you know, these various pricing options, you know, they, they still need to be evaluated, but, you know, it, it could have significant impacts of reducing the amount of generation needed as, at a specific time on the grid. Um, so fewer power plants, fewer gas-fired plants, things like that. I mean, there, there could be very significant impacts. Um, it's just not known yet. I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on it, but they're think, looking from, into it. Yeah, from what I've heard with, from the, the folks at, at pg e that are collecting this data, it's, uh, it's at least a year out before they have programs that um, can be used by customers that are that are usable, and there, there will be some pressure put on them, um, put on the, the IOUs um, by the CPUC to use that data for real-time pricing, um, as, as Beth was saying, and um, for other you know, customer education and energy efficiency um, benefits, but it seems to be more of a, a public interest or a CPC interest than it is an IOU interest. So they're they're moving, but not very quickly. Well, I, have a, I mean, Wendy's, we've got all the smart meters in place. They've been in place for a while now, and I mean, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand, I mean, the whole concept, smart meters, more data, but it doesn't seem like there's been, there's any, there's anything yet that benefits the public, as Director Cromwell has, has aptly asked. Yeah, 
So that's the answer, right? Yeah, I think it's, okay. it's also Got worth it. mentioning that the smart meter data is not being used for settlement purposes. Yeah. So the smart meter data isn't used to bill customers yet. Um, so that um, that's unfortunate, and, and it's something that we'd like to do. Um, that's one reason why we're eager to get that data. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, I'm going to happen to be an energy engineer um, who um, studied these issues and worked these issues often. And uh, in PG&E's defense, in some ways, the uh, smart meter are used to identify uh, localized outages. So they are being used for positive public benefit. So there's much faster response in case of uh, distribution outage, things of that nature. So there is a positive benefit. You mean instead of someone calling on the phone and saying my power is out or they now have the smart meters to be able to look on a computer screen somewhere that a neighborhood or a, or a city or something is out of power? It's a little more complex than that. Um, there, there could be a, a number of people with power outage and then be able to really zone in on exactly where the power outage is within a radio feeder. So that's the benefit. Yeah, there's, there's actually um, one of the one of the proceedings that we're involved with is the um, uh, PG&E Smart Grid pilot deployment application, and so that is sort of the first step in exactly what you're talking about, and, and also what Eric had raised, um, which is how you determine you know outages in a particular place on the line. How how quickly can you get trucks to that location? How quickly can you restore power? Um, you know, and like I mentioned before, some of them relate to um, forecasting and projections and um, gaining more certainty there. But you know, usually what the, the approach that the commission has taken in the past and exactly what they're doing now is they go through a pilot phase and then a deployment phase. Yes. Next uh, question. Uh, yeah, um, hmm. Just as a data point, I just literally got a note today. Uh, PG&E that they are starting right now to install uh, smart meters for net, net metering customers, which they hadn't been doing before. Uh, and that included promises of a wonderful application online and be able to go online and see all the data that you get in your, your graphical statements that they send every month to solar customers and things like that. So I assume that's closer than a year away. I mean, I'm silly to put it in a brochure it's that far away. So. My question uh, goes to Don, and that is, it's related. A question came up about whether or not CCA customers, or MEA customers in this case, have access to the online data, kind of what you just referenced, in terms of their energy usage. Um, and right now, I think pg e contracts with Opower, I think, is the company that does that technology platform. Um, does that mean that MEA's customers also have access to that, or is that something that MEA would offer separately to its customer base later? Yeah, so that, that's the, so there's, um, sort of getting back to the, the privacy decision that right. we were discussing before, there's two components of the, this data. One is data protection, and the second one is data availability, and essentially um, the way that it's structured at the commission is the utilities are going to recover the distribution rates, the data availability portion, since they're responsible for the meter. And so um, so our customers are, you know, it's equally available to them. You can go to the PG website. website and it, they've been calling it the green button approach. Um, and so you know, click a button and it downloads your data and you have it available to you. And then presumably you know, additional interface or an adult on top of that to make it. So there wouldn't be any need for, for MEA to engage in its own technology platform. No, we, we could. Um, so we're not, it's not mandatory for us to, um, you know, we're not prohibited from uh, making the data available to our customers. If we decide to make the data available to our customers, uh, there are, uh, in the same decision, it, it references, you know, what, um, what protections and what steps you need to take to make sure that there's um, safe transmission of your data to your customers. Should so you it's something that, that it's something that we could elect to do. We would just need to follow certain rules and procedures to ensure that information is is well protected. Thank you. Yes. Hi, <coughs> uh, Stan Sparrow from Tebron. And uh, if you look at pg and and click under the tab My Usage, 
And you can see your actual real-time use. It's a new format. It's just recent with pg &E. There's a little delay, like, like five minutes or so, from your actual use to what you see. And this is important for people who are on the time of use rate, which is really good for, I think, ramping energy if more people are aware of time of use and could switch appliances to the nighttime load when we have so much wind available and not much uh, solar. And um, the uh, General Electric just announced that they have smart appliances now available that turn themselves on and off by the rate from the smart meter. So if you're in the peak time, the refrigerator has enough uh, intelligence to work accordingly for the things. Although, it's another Wi-Fi deck thing going through your appliances to the smart meter. And I was in a doctor's meeting, and it's official. Smart meter syndrome is really, really hurting people. The doctors are finding a lot of people their lives have really, really been affected. 5% uh, of Californians are very, very sensitive to the smart meter uh, Wi-Fi and pg &E's information of the radio frequencies are not at all accurate what they're telling the people. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, uh, uh, yeah, the, um... <coughs> The question that, that Lynn asked about the data, um, I guess oh, there you are. Uh, it, it's the databases were kind of the last thing they developed. The, they did everything else first and then didn't get to the databases. And uh, my understanding is, maybe uh, Beth knows more about this, is that there is a, a whole proceeding underway to have the utilities um, contract with Livermore Labs. Uh, to crunch data from smart meters. There's, there's already been one proceeding and a lawyer that I work with who you've seen a couple of times basically said they, you know, they don't have um, a way to use the data you know, in their system. They can show it to the customer. There's things that they can do that they haven't done much of, but as far as utilizing that data in other ways that you know, people dreamed about for the smart grid, um, that was kind of like the last thing they thought about, and apparently they're, the meters of this technology that they chose doesn't even do much in terms of, you know, you know working with the data. So it's, it's that crazy. It's, it's weirder than, even than, than you thought, um, unfortunately. Uh, so, and it, you can also tell from the procurement proceeding, which I'm sure we're going to get to, um, that uh, the actual use of smart grid data in procurement isn't even on the radar in the procurement proceeding, which is sick. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've been trying to get them to do is to provide data on where, just simply where are your solar um, installations in your community. You hook them up, you know where they are, just give us a list, you know, where the, you know, what is the aggregation of solar panels per substation that would protect customer confidentiality and we you know we have a piece of information that would be very useful well they they don't have that data and they have no plans to get it or produce it and, and the other thing that i've been trying to get them to do is to uh, aggregate energy efficiency data by substation okay where do you say the energy and this is a big issue in the, in the procurement <coughs> for the local capacity requirements they're saying well, we cannot use any demand response or any energy efficiency, zero, zero energy efficiency um, in our assumptions about how to serve customers because we don't know where it is. And depending on what kind of a neighborhood it is, whether it's a commercial neighborhood or a residential neighborhood, they would probably be saving different amounts of energy efficiency because they would have different kinds of programs. But they have never correlated any of that information with the grid. It exists in a completely separate universe, which is just ridiculous. And and we could get that kind of information without smart meter data at all. You don't need that. Um, we'd have our energy efficiency data that we could um, correlate. We would just use 
the energy efficiency measurement and verification, EMNV, um, for determining things like this, you know, that really matter to procurement rather than shareholders and centers. That's Thank you. <laughs> okay, Ben. Um, on to the next slide. Um, and actually, before I, I discuss what's on here, uh, Barbara had brought up the uh, the long-term procurement plan. This is determining how um, the investor and utilities are going to procure over the longer term span. Um, we have been involved in that proceeding. I, I did not add a slide in on that. I'm, I'm waiting until it gets a little bit more ripe on the issues that we're discussing. But we did file testimony um, that related to the cost allocation mechanism. This is a statutory provision which allows um, a pass through of capacity costs um, to all customers, including CCA customers and direct access customers. Um, on an equal basis for resources that serve a, a local or system area reliability need. Um, so there are many issues um, that are raised by CAM, um, but one of the one of the the options that we're raising in the LTPP is the idea of a CAM opt-out. So entities which are you know, responsibly procuring capacity on a going on a long-term going forward basis could opt out of this charge. Essentially, could opt out of PG procuring on our behalf, procuring capacity on our behalf. Um, and so, once once we get a little bit further down the line, there I'll have you know I'll bring in some slides um, on that. But just these um, cost allocation <coughs> issues crop up in a lot of different venues. Um, one related to the, the advice letter, which I, I've included in the slides, advice letter 4074E. This does get a little bit <laughs> abstract, so I, I feel bad for all of you. Trust me. Um, the, there was a highly complex settlement that was reached a couple of years ago um, that essentially granted combined heat and power, so CHP facilities, with CAM treatment. Um, there's a specific RFO process that the utilities go through to procure CHP. Um, pg &E had modified their process so that they could procure not just energy and capacity together, but a specific capacity only project, um, which was not contemplated by the settlement. So we, we protested that, um, and we've, we've had ongoing discussions with the commission regarding lack of clarity on the settlement. Um, Questions have come up regarding, you know, is there a CHP cap? It can can the utilities just procure CHP at any level and it's still deemed to have a global or system area reliability need? Um, and obviously, we're concerned with the change in the the, um, the PGB processes, which would include additional resources into this controversial bucket. Um, so. We have jointly protested this advice letter. It's currently on ice, um, so the commission is holding off on making a decision. Um, I'll inform you once there's been movement on that, but this is also arising, this issue of capacity only contracts is also arising in Southern California. So usually we don't become involved in Southern California um, issues, but since it's impacting, this lack of clarity on the rules is going to be impacting costs to our customers. Um, we may file a protest in um, certain RA contracts in the Southern California area. Um, so abstract, but this has been going on for a couple of years now, and uh, there doesn't seem to be um, complete clarity in sight. Um, however, there is good news <laughs> related to the camps. So if we can go to the next slide, um, pg &E every year uh, has a case called the Energy Resource Recovery Account, and this is how they recover generation procurement for the year. Um, they provide testimony on what their resources are, what the vintages are, so that, that's how vintaging is how the power charging indifference adjustment, the PCIA, um, is passed through to customers. Furthermore, this is where the calculation is run for the cost allocation mechanism. And so we were actually the only and to need to serve testimony in this case, and it was um, uh, Jeremy Wayne's first testimony at the commission. Um, it was 
but highly successful, uh, very readable. Everybody should hop into the regulatory packet and read the testimony. Um, on these two points, what we noted is there were a couple of contracts where there was improper vintaging, um, and in a couple of cases, improper inclusion into the CAM um, due to some lack of clarity uh, of the settlement. So um, in pg es rebuttal testimony, they agreed in its entirety um, with the testimony we set forth, and so those corrections will be made. And so it's kind of nice to actually have, uh, yes, we think that was smaller, we'll correct that and move forward. So it's um, you know, the value of our participation and um, you know the staff that we have working on this has been, um, it's always nice to have steps forward <laughs> and improving the process and making sure um, things are calculated properly for, for our customers. Can I ask a question on that? Does that mean that, that the overcharge PCIA, you know, that there's going to be rebate checks mailed? Is that what that no, means? No, what is it, just, what does it's, it mean? It's, how, it's, it's on a going forward basis with the and so there's... <laughs> okay, I just wanted English what you just said. Yeah, okay. so what this relates to is a modification that, you know, there's there's a significant list of, you know, all of each of these resources, and you can determine by the the approval dates, um, or their... So are you saying on a go-forward basis the charges will be smaller? Is that what you're Correct. saying? Okay, got it. Yeah, okay. Sorry. That's, that's okay, good. Sure. Uh, yes. Aren't, aren't, aren't they in the process of sending out some rebates for overcharges that have already like, accrued? Yeah, so last year, um, MEA participated in a large consortium um, to to address significant modifications to the calculations of the PCIA. So what the PCIA is a calculation of the above market cost of power um, that was procured on behalf of departing load customers prior to their departure. I know that's not English, but that is what <laughs> it actually is. Um, in essence, the way that the calculation had been run previously is it treated the market cost of power as just a brown power cost. And so when you have high cost renewable energy, um, the, the sort of spread that our customers would have to pay was significantly higher. Um, so in through another proceeding, um, our 0705, 025, which is the direct access proceeding, um, we had argued that there needed to be major modifications to the, the calculation of the PCIA. And so there are several, the, 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 the main factor that was an improvement for us was the inclusion of what we call the green adder. So the, the green contracts and the re renewable contracts are compared against um, a renewable benchmark. And so that reduced the above market uh, cost of power and then you know, ground power is compared with ground power. And then there were a couple of other, um, uh, you know, more minor issues, the exclusion of certain um, TISO costs from the calculation. It was um, an in-depth proceeding, but uh, that those revisions were significant and undertaken, but now it comes to the point of the refund checks, which maybe Don can touch on the that sort of post-regulatory process. Yeah, so we were informed uh, about seven days ago that pg &E was going to begin issuing checks to customers to account for the overpayment of the PCIA between April 2011 um, and uh, uh, June, was it April or June of 2012? April, April 2012, um, when the PCIA changed. Yeah, it was the end of June. Uh-huh, so I'm right, we are getting so checks. we are getting checks. <laughs> I thought I read that. It's just a different proceeding line, come on. Yeah. <laughs> the checks are still coming. The checks are still coming. We're not getting more checks. Don't hold you. Yes. In English, the checks are coming. The checks are in the mail. Can I, can I ask one other question? Thank you. How, how, do you, how, do, how do we know that the utility isn't reselling the previously procured power elsewhere. I mean, is there really a way of determining whether there's actually any uh, cost to them? Or is that, that uh, like that's an after the, the meeting that's discussion? a wonderful, obvious question. And um, I think the, the answer is that um, 
and pg e is very likely reselling that power. They're in the market constantly buying power, and, um, and thus our argument, in wherever possible and proceeding, has been that there's no need for a PCIA. Sure. Um, however, we have we have not prevailed on that argument yet. Um, we're continuing to try uh, because I, I think that's um, a very obvious scenario that's play, playing out on a daily basis. I, I'd suggest that's a really big deal since the PCIA. I mean, it seems to be one of the big sticking points, probably in the focus groups and all of that. It makes us more expensive, period. And that we, I think, we should put a lot of energy into that that point if we can do that. If PG&E is really just selling the stuff anyway, so they don't need to charge us. They're selling it twice. It's yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a good business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I guess, you know, for now, the, the, the revisions that were made to the PCI were extremely favorable. It came much closer to in line with what, in theory, the PCI was supposed to do. Um, so, at a minimum, this was, the, these revisions were a very significant win for our customers. And it's because of the, the efforts of NEA and the other parties that work with us jointly. Um, to, to address the PCIA, we, we spent a lot of time and resources in 2011 to um, make, or and in 2010, to get this revision made. So it's a big win, and it will continue to, to flow through to the formula of the, of the PCIA every year going forward. So it's it's a dramatic reduction in, the, in what the PCIA would have been. Um, but it is our view that the PCIA should be limited to a year at a minimum, um, and pg &A should be able to adjust their load accordingly within that time frame. Um, or it should be just completely eliminated. But that would enable us to beat their price, wouldn't it? Yeah, this year it would. And keep in mind that their rates change on a routine basis, ours change, and so, you know, but at this point in time, yes, our, our rates are lower. It's the PCIA that causes the total cost to be a little higher. Yeah. Interesting. So does anybody have questions that arose from their thorough reading of the rates? <laughs> <laughs> Very good discussion yes. and great work. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. yeah, I think there's been very, very good progress on the regular board. Um, Thanks for that report. Mm -hmm. Okay, item seven, uh, board member and staff matters. Seeing none. Oh, I do have one. Uh -oh. Um, uh -oh. I should have mentioned this at the beginning, <laughs> sorry. I just wanted to, um, acknowledge uh, the excitement around going paperless and um, remind everyone that we're really going down a path here where we're able to save money on printing packets. We did an analysis and um, it was adding up quite a bit. Um, the time that it takes to compile the packets, so we're saving staff resources as well. Um, and we're saving a lot of trees. So um, kudos to all the board members for taking the step of going electronic. I'm trying to read myself as well off the paper. Um, and so we let us know if you're having any issues um, making that transition. Um, if you're if you're completely having too much trouble, we're happy to um, to you know have you turn in the electronic device and we can go pay with paper again. Um, but we um, are grateful that. Um, Many of you are wanting to make that shift, and we think it'll be a great savings of resources and money going forward. And please be patient with us. We're trying. I'm trying to. We're going to bring up the, the new clerk to speed, and she'll be able to hopefully give you guys any assistance you would need with the iPad. But yeah, if, if you have any questions, I'm. I've gotten really good at this iPad thing, so bring them on, and I'll, I'll help you. <laughs> so Don Monday retreat starting what time? It starts at 9.30, it's at the Marin Art and Garden Center, and um, it's a full day that includes lunch. Um, our afternoon will um, probably not be dragging out, but I think that the, the number of presentations that we have, the presentations that we have will be fairly succinct, so I'm confident we'll wrap up by 4.30, probably a little bit earlier. Great. Okay, thank you, everyone. We're adjourned.